Relationships and Preventing Expulsion in Early Learning, GLE presented by Team Wolfpack, featuring Cassie, Cheryl, Christina, Nadir, and Sai. Bright Spark mission is to nurture and sustain child-centered, anti-racist early learning communities. So the information that you hear in today's GLE will be pushed towards the, that mission. So first we would like to do our land and labor acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge with gratitude the land we are on. We recognize that we are on the land of the Coast Salish people who stewarded these lands and are still here today. We also acknowledge that the land that we occupy was built by the labor of enslaved Africans as well. At Bright Spark, we stand against all forms of racism and ask that you stand with us in, in racism and its, all its forms as well. And February is Black History Month, and we ask that you take the time to learn about and acknowledge your biases and privileges. And this is an important first step in starting your anti-racist journey. So there's a poem by Henry Clark uh, called History is a Clock that people used to tell. Their political and cultural time of day, it is also a compass that people use to find themselves on a map of human geography. The role of history is to tell a people what they have been, where they have been, and what they are and where they are. The most important role that history plays is that it has the foundation, where they still must go and what they still must be. First, we're going to speak about how does building relationships prevent expulsion. Building strong relationships with children, families, and other staff in preschool setting plays a crucial role in preventing expulsion and suspensions, leading to better outcomes for all involved. Strong relationships enable teachers to gain deeper insights into children's individual needs, strengths, and challenges, allowing for tailored teaching and support to be individualized to the child's needs. Effective communication with families fosters collaboration and early identification of potential concerns, leading to proactive interventions before disruptive behaviors escalate. So you're able to see and have an awareness of those problems and address them in a way that it doesn't disrupt the, the center's uh, environment. Strong relationships provide a secure base for children to explore and learn encouraging positive social-emotional development. Children with strong relationships are more likely to exhibit pro-social behavior, manage emotions effectively, and resolve conflicts peacefully, reducing the likelihood of disruptive behaviors. Positive relationships build trust between teachers, families, and children, creating a supportive environment where everyone feels respected and valued. This fosters collaboration in developing strategies to address challenging behaviors when they come, leading to positive solutions that work for everyone. Positive relationships build trust between teachers, families, and children, creating a supportive environment where everyone feels respected and valued. This fosters collaboration in developing strategies to address challenging behaviors, leading to positive solutions that work for everyone. How does building relationships prevent expulsion? Get to know, and these are different strategies that you can use to build those relationships. Get to know each child in their family. Learn about their strengths, interests, and needs. This will help you tailor your teaching approach and create a positive learning environment for each child. Build rapport with families. Communicate openly and regularly about the child's progress and any concerns you may have. So don't wait till when you have a problem to start uh, communicating with the, the family. Uh, you know, you should be, you know, greeting them and speaking with them on a daily basis so that when something does come about, it doesn't seem like you're singling out that family or that child. Be culturally responsive. Understand and respect the different backgrounds and experiences of your students and their families. Next, um, to address, you know, behaviors that may come arise inside of your environment, PBIS is a framework for creating a school-wide system to promote positive behavior. 
It involves setting clear expectations, teaching children how to meet those expectations, and providing positive reinforcement for good behavior. And you can also work with other professionals, such as school counselors, social workers, your coach, um, and your mental health consultants to develop a plan for your child that may be struggling inside of your center. And then you can also seek professional development opportunities. There are many resources available to help teachers learn more about building relationships with children and families, preventing challenging behaviors, and supporting child, uh, the children's social emotional development that can um, definitely help with you creating those different bonds and relationships that can um, be preventative of exposures and suspensions. All right. Thank you, Nadir. That's a perfect segue into our topic about teacher sensitivity and responsiveness. In my experience, teacher sensitivity is often mischaracterized and misinterpreted. It's not about how nice or caring teachers are. Rather, it's about how teachers consistently demonstrate awareness and responsiveness to children's current academic and emotional abilities and needs. Today, we'll take a look at what it looks like in a big group setting and how we can effectively utilize small group settings to build stronger relationships with our students. As we all know, in big group settings, big voices and personalities tend to stand out the most, while the more quiet and timid personalities tend to get lost in the shuffle. Our job as a teacher is to make sure we are aware of every child's needs. Here are some cues to look for in these big group settings. First is knowing your student, body language. If you know your student, you're attentive, the child will often communicate to you very loudly with their body, how they are feeling and their level of participation for that day. If they're lethargic, body is slumped, they might be feeling sad, low energy, they might be feeling tired. If they can't keep still, maybe they're feeling anxious, nervous, or just they just need a task to do. Sometimes as a teacher, that's a perfect opportunity for you to use that kid who has so much energy as a leader. Have the calendar be that job for the uh, student that day. Have them lead any of the songs or any of the active activities. Make them feel seen. A lot of the students, when they're communicating these needs with their body language, they just want to be seen. They just want to be heard. Next is their voice level. Are they loud and talkative? Quiet and wanting to hide? Maybe they want to engage, but they don't know they don't know how, or they seem upset or frustrated with their tone of voice, or you can tell that they're feeling sad that day. Also, when you know your students, you can tell the changes in their behavior. Being aware of any of the changes, like if they're typically talkative, and all of a sudden he's quiet today, or maybe they aren't feeling well, they're feeling extra sad. Sometimes a teacher might miss those cues and then have the expectation for that, you know, that student to be able to engage and participate that day. If you see some of those cues, it might mean that that student today, their level of participation might be a little bit less than their normal, uh, usual day. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right. So once you know what to look for, now it's time to put that into action. It's being aware and being responsive. First is prioritizing the child. This is my, my, my biggest key and always one thing to remember is there's no lesson or circle time that's more important than the child. Sometimes a teacher will feel constrained by the time or, and then they will feel like they need to dismiss a child's needs just to make sure that the lesson continues of flowing on. And sometimes it's all right to just pause and to attend to the need. It's utilizing your assistance. If you don't have if you don't have the proper attention span during that time because you have to lead a lesson, sometimes you can't individually address a specific need. This is where your assistant comes into play. Have a plan. Your assistant should know their responsibilities during circle time. And lastly, it's being flexible. If 14 of your students in, at circle time are communicating to you that they cannot sit still, then you might have to divert from that activity and either change it up or completely scrap it all together and do something different. A child's capacity to focus and engage is always based on their current state of emotions and or the overall class's temperature. All right, next slide. Now, in a smaller group setting, this is the best environment to have more intimate interactions and to be able to build stronger relationships with your student. So these are keys for you and strategies that you can use in the classroom. First is setting up your student for success being very intentional. Build up their confidence by setting up an activity that you know that they do really well in for you and your student to do together with that they will excel and they will feel good about it. And this is your chance and your opportunity to come in there 
to praise them and point out the things they're doing specifically well. Now be attentive, listen to what they're saying when you're in these smaller group settings. Treat them like they are a paying customer and you are a cashier taking orders. If they ask for a burger and you give them a salad, they're not gonna be happy. The same goes with needs. A child will communicate to you what their need is, take the time to listen so you can appropriately address what that specific need is. And lastly, it's asking specific questions. Don't just ask general questions. You want to ask questions that are specific to what that child is doing, maybe what that child is feeling. So then that child knows that they are being seen and you are specifically talking to them. All right. The biggest obstacle I've found with teacher sensitivity and responsiveness is having unrealistic developmental expectations for a child. And when you have that unrealistic expectation, you find yourself getting upset at things that a student isn't develop uh, developmentally capable of yet. That or you haven't had the time to actually teach that child how to perform a certain task, how to get in line, how to sit properly in circle time. You have to be able to be responsible as a teacher to teach and have those steps um, taught to the, uh, to the students. Um, first is... One of the examples is expecting a child to sit at circle time for too long, for an extended time. Um, you gotta have a clock in your mind. At circle time, there may be some kids that can sit for four to five minutes. Maybe some kids that can only sit for one to two minutes. You have to keep that in mind in terms of the activities and the lessons that you are having and that you're trying to do with your kids. Now, as a teacher, you are in control of your feelings and how you react to certain things in the classroom. You can choose to be upset at certain things by changing your own mindset and setting your expectations appropriately. Take driving a car as an example. If every time I drive a car, I choose to be upset at every stoplight, at every red light, then I will guarantee that every time I drive, I'm gonna have a negative experience. Same thing goes with your experience in the classroom as well. You can choose to be upset at some of these things that happen in the classroom that are bound to happen every day, or you can choose to um, so this is similar to the way they perceive uh, behaviors in the classroom. Every day you encounter a challenge that would frustrate you or behavior from a kid that disrupts the classroom flow. If you allow every interruption to upset you every time a child isn't perfectly in line, then you're only going to set yourself up for a bad and miserable day. It's setting the expectation and having the mindset to have a positive day that's going to have uh, that's going to give you a much a easier day moving forward. Thank you, C. So what does relationship building actually look like day-to-day uh, -day in the classroom environment? So it doesn't have to be grand gestures or something that takes up a lot of time. Relationship building, it's all about creating positive connections with the children each and every day. And to do this effectively, you have to get to know each child as an individual and really accept them for who they are. Remember that effective teachers will modify their teaching and their teaching styles to accommodate the different learning styles of the children in the environment. So let's see what some examples of this looks like on a daily basis. So one of the biggest things to set the tone for both the child, for you and for the family is smiling and showing joy each day at their arrival. It makes a huge difference and everybody picks up on it. Asking about their home lives and their interests outside of the early learning program, getting to know the whole child and not just the child you see for the eight to 10 hours per day. One of the biggest ways you can build relationship with children is playing with them each day and expressing joy you have being around them, laughing together, and just having fun. One example is you can pat or rub their backs at nap time um, with the child's permission. Um, they will let you know if they don't want you to, um, but that's really create that type of affection does help um, build those relationships. And again, in a similar vein, showing affection verbally and in appropriate physical ways, high fives, hugs, um, letting a child sit on your lap, letting them know how happy you are to see them each day, 
um, that you're grateful that they are in your classroom. And starting each day as a new day. Um, if you have a child who's having a rough day or a rough week, who's been having some behavior challenges, leave it at the end of the day, that day is done. Give them the benefit of the doubt that the new day will be a good day. They see what you expect of them and they will give you exactly what you expect. So if you look for the positive, they will try to show you the positive as well. Simple things like getting down on the child's level while talking with them shows that you care and that you see them um, as a full person. For infants, really holding them during mealtime and talking with them during mealtime and diaper changes creates lots of connections during those times. Uh, showing respect when touching or moving a child um, let them know what you're going to do before you do it. Um, think about if you were an infant or a young toddler and you're just sitting there playing with a toy and all of a sudden you just get swooped up from behind and taken somewhere. It can be a little jarring. So use that respect and let them know, hey, I'm going to pick you up and we're going to go change your diaper. So filling up each child's piggy bank each day. And this goes for adults as well. We all want to hear positive, um, happy thoughts about ourselves and know that we're doing well, that people around us care for us. So let them know that. That way, if there is something that you need to talk to the child about, they know that they have that secure and solid relationship with you and that they may be able to work with you a little bit better when they know that they are already loved. Allow and encourage the expression of all emotions, even emotions such as anger um, and all those negative type emotions. We all have them. Children have them even more. Um, and they're still learning what those emotions are called. They're figuring out how it makes their bodies feel. And it's the provider's role to help them know that that is okay and how to deal with those emotions in a positive manner. You can allow children to move and fidget. Um, you know, as C was mentioning, sometimes sitting at circle time is hard. It doesn't necessarily mean they're not interested in what's going on. Sometimes the children need to move in order to focus. So again, it's being aware of the different learning styles that are happening. Uh, show a genuine interest in the child's home language and culture will really create those and build those relationships that you see them, again, as a whole person and a whole family just outside that exists outside of your classroom walls as well. Encourage all children to try and exceed in what matters to them. And then lastly for the families, which the children will also pick up on, is making a point to give families some sort of positive feedback on a daily basis. The teachers have, or I'm sorry, families have a busy day at work, often long days, they miss their children, they have to pick them up, they have to go home and have dinner and maybe read a book and put them to bed and their day is very, very busy. So the last thing they want to hear every pickup is all of the challenges you had during the day. So giving that positive feedback really helps build relationships with the children because they're listening um, and with the families. And as it was mentioned before, if there are concerns that you do need to bring up, this makes it easier because you've already created a solid relationship and the family knows that you do care for their child and you really do want what's best. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, going beyond saying I'm sorry and teaching empathy. 
So empathy is the ability to put yourself in the shoes of someone else and understand what they are feeling or, or going through. In the early years of life, when children are infants and toddlers and even preschoolers, we're very ego, ego, egocentric, meaning we really focus on ourselves and um, having our own needs met. Um, it isn't until um, pre-K, later in preschool and school age that children begin to consider the needs of, of others. But that doesn't mean that we can't start teaching that sense of empathy early on in life. Um, teaching empathy is an important part of child development as well into um, uh, l l l later in life. So helping young children develop a strong sense of empathy is beneficial because it helps them to build a sense of security and stronger re relationships with other, other children as well as their, um, their teachers. Um, when they have that strong sense of um, security, they can focus in on, on learning. Um, it encourages tolerance and being able to um, accept others. Um, it also promotes good, good mental health. It promotes social harmony and can reduce the likelihood of bullying. So what can you do to help children develop empathy for uh, others is um, empathize with your child and validate their, um, their feelings. Make sure that you let them know that it's okay and that emotions are, are okay to have. Um, talk about the feelings, um, not just their feelings, but the feelings of others, drawing attention to the emotions that, that are, that are happening, um, throughout the um the day um suggest how children can show empathy um if they have a friend that is hurt how can they help make them feel better if a friend who had their block tower that they worked really hard on that got knocked over could they go help them um fix that um and then talk about activities and stories that talk about feelings so social stories are um are really great resources for this, as well as um, books about um, different f f feelings and emotions. Um, be a good role model using I statements, um, using statements like, um, you hit your friend, I don't like that, it hurts when you hit, is gonna show and model good, um, good skills. Um, allowing and validate difficult emotions. So allow children for um, a space to express emotions, even when they are big emotions, they might be angry, they might be sad. Um, validate them, let them know that you, that you, um, you hear them and that make, and that is okay for them, for them to f f feel those emotions. Um, pretend play is a great way to act out different um, emotional scenarios in a in a safe way. And then most importantly, be um, be patient. Learning about empathy and um, different emotions takes time and children do develop at different rates. Okay, and then often insisting that children say, I'm sorry. Um, as a way for them to take responsibilities for their um, for their action, so, but many children do not fully understand what the words "I'm I'm I'm sorry" means. You know, that's something that we've been socially told to do is that if you hurt somebody, you have to apologize. But saying "I'm sorry" doesn't necessarily uh, mean that children are in fact sorry. A more meaningful approach can be to help children focus on other people's feelings and to take actions to help one another. Again, the sorry is meaningless in the, unless the children can put into action ways to make someone uh, feel better. So what can you do instead of forcing a child to say, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, is bringing children together. So if two children are having an argument or one child gets, um, gets hurt, make sure that you have both of those children come together um, talk to the child that um, hurt his um, his uh, his friend about what he did and point out that he or she 
hurt and hurt the other child and now and now that child is um is sad making sure that you're labeling the emotions and connecting it to the physical action look if she is crying because you you hit her model empathy for the um for the children if a child is sad and upset you yourself are showing empathy for them you pick them up you give them loves you try to make them feel better and then take action to fix the um the problems making a guarantee that that behavior won't happen again um saying that you're never going to hurt somebody again without making a promise that it isn't going to happen it is just words so having children really talk about you know, what can I do instead of this? When I'm angry, I can't hit my friends. Maybe I can take, you know, deep breaths. I can walk away. So giving them um, alternative options for that. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, now we're going to talk about how to build and repair relationships. Building relationships with your students can start from the first moment a child and their caregivers walk into the door to tour your classroom. Creating an environment that is warm and inviting can foster a sense of comfort, if coupled with your warmth and smiles upon meeting a student. You as a teacher have the capacity to set the tone of the classroom for better or for worse. All children need to feel accepted and loved as they are. It is also vital that they form bonds with trusting adults in addition to their primary caregivers. This helps a child to feel a sense of belonging and community within your classroom. Relationship building is foundational for any successful classroom and can enable you to genuinely meet children where they are in any given moment, allowing you to best meet their individual needs. You might also find that the children who have some, some of the most difficult behaviors will benefit the most from some of the strategies that we've shared today. If you have students who have some of the more difficult behaviors, these strategies will help immensely in helping a child to learn new strategies to get their needs met within the classroom. So now we will go over some strategies that you can use that will both build and repair relationships. So the first one is play. This is by far the best way to develop a relationship with a child. Their play is where they are exploring the world around them. And when you engage in play with a child, you are sending a message to them that you enjoy spending time with them and this goes a long way. Spending this time on the floor engaged in child-led play lets them know that you care and enables you to be present to support with scaffolding and problem solving and conflict resolution. Aside from the social and emotional aspect of relationship building, when you play with a child, you begin to see where they are developmentally and will be much more successful at scaffolding a child's learning because you will have more knowledge of where they are developmentally. The next one is positive interactions. When you are able to meet each conflict or difficult situation through a positive lens, you are teaching and modeling skills that you want to see in the classroom. Children notice how the adults interact with each other and other students, and this sets the tone of the classroom. When you show a child how you problem solve in conflict or troubleshoot frustrating situations, that a child might experience, you're modeling strategies that can be used to solve problems or resolve conflict. Addressing a child's frustrations with a genuine concern is also very important because a child's problems may feel just as big as adult-sized problems and they should never be minimized. This offers a chance for you to help the student problem solve and practice brainstorming solutions, which is a necessary life skill. With time and practice, this can help your students feel independence and, comp and confidence as they learn how to do this on their own. Just like modeling positive interactions and behavior management in the classroom, the same can be said for reacting in anger and frustration to behaviors in the classroom. Children look to you, the adult, for how to interact with others. If they see the teacher treating others in a way that is negative or punitive, this is what they think is okay to do. You set the tone of what you want to do in the classroom, and this becomes what you see from your students. You have a lot of influence, and so it is very important that you are always approaching everything from a place that is supportive to problem solving and done with kindness. Another way that you um, can build relationships is by setting boundaries. One of the ways to support relationship building is to set boundaries and have them in place helps a child to feel safe and secure in your care. Of course, young children are always going to test your boundaries, and as they grow and develop, 
their boundaries will shift and change, but it is still very important for children to know what the limits are because without them, they won't have a sense of safety and security that they need. Each morning, you wanna make sure that you greet each child as they enter the classroom. Some children need support in getting settled into the classroom for the day and may need extra care and comfort. Helping them to find routine in that part of the day with saying goodbye to their caregivers will help, this, help make this daily transition smoother over time. This is something that happens much easier each day when you have taken the time to foster your relationship because the child needs to trust you for this to be a smooth transition. And lastly, have fun. Children are full of wonder and joy and teaching should be enjoyable. Yes, teaching is a difficult job, but it st should still be enjoyable overall. If you're not having fun, something needs to change because no matter where you are in your teaching journey, you have the capacity to improve anything in your classroom to infuse it with more joy and fun. Children thrive in environments that are loving and inviting and a big piece of that is what you bring to the classroom. When all else fails and you feel like things are in a constant struggle, turn it into a game and bring the class together in fun activities and experiences. The more you do this, the more you will engage your students and through this you'll foster a sense of trust. Thank you, Christina. Uh, the next topic we're going to speak on is checking your biases. <clears throat> so acknowledging and addressing implicit bias is an ongoing process, not a one-time event. Be patient with yourself and others and celebrate even small steps towards your greater inclusivity. So the first thing you want to do is start with your own self-awareness. Uh, there's available um, implicit bias tests that are online that you can take that will um, assist you with reflecting on your own experiences and upbringing. Um, allow yourself to identify areas where you might hold unconscious biases related to race, gender, socioeconomic status, and abilities. Uh, next, examine your classroom environment. Look for materials, books, and decorations that might reflect your own biases or lack of diversity. This could include the types of toys available where the characters are portrayed in books or the images displayed on the walls. Uh, and if they are not healthy, you know, you should remove them from the environment. Um, and pay attention to your interactions. Um, observe your interactions with your children. Are you more likely to praise certain behaviors or offer opportunities to certain groups of children? So that type of self-reflection and self-inventory is important when you're in the process of checking your biases to see if you know the way you're reacting to certain behaviors is equitable. <clears throat> and then the next step is to actively challenge those biases. Um, being mindful of your language that you use when you speak of things. Uh, watch for gender language, stereotypes, or assumptions about abilities based on appearances. Um, try not to use adultifying languages when you're describing behaviors and actions of children. So um, being very mindful and conscious of that as well. Provide diverse representation. Ensure your classroom reflects the diversity of the children that you serve in materials, decorations, and activities, uh, including the music that you play. So make sure that you know the children have some familiarity with that. And if you are in an environment that lacks diversity, it's just as important for you to include uh, diverse images, uh, materials, and decorations, as well as um, languages to include for them so they can be exposed to different um the different races and cultures and um people um that's educational and a learning experience for the children as well next use inclusive teaching practices offer multiple ways for children to learn and express themselves catering to different learning styles and abilities so you, that means you have to be flexible um in how you are looking for things to be delivered from the children um, and that comes with patience as well. And intervene when you see bias. If you observe yourself or others exhibiting uh, bias, address it in a respectful and constructive manner. Because um, as we said in the beginning, you know, we're all growing and this is a learning experience for all of us. 
So uh, having that respect for each other and the ability to um, help each other to grow when we see that there needs um, there needs to be growth in different areas and doing that in a respective manner. Um, and then next, uh, seek professional development opportunities. Attend workshops or training on diversity and inclusion, implicit bias, and culturally responsive teaching practices that you can use that can help you um, to create an environment that will be uh, inclusive and um, in a healthy environment for all children that you serve. All right, thank you, Nadir. Um, so now we're gonna talk about uh, building a strong um, relationship with your, um, with your families. And one of the most impactful things that you can do to improve a child's experience at your child care center is to focus on building re, re relationships with your families. Um, for most children, home and child care are the two most common places where, where they spend most of their time. So it is important that the parents and teachers can foster positive re, um, re uh, relationships to provide the best possible environment for um, for each child. Um, positive connections between parents and children have been shown to improve children's academics, um, social competencies, and their emotional well um, well being. Um, so how can you form construct um, form constructive family and teacher partnerships? I'm um, using the the three um three C's. So the first C is going to be um communication. So keeping um, guardians frequently updated on what is happening um throughout the um of the a day and creating space for families to let teachers know um important things that um that are going on with their um child. Knowing about a child's life at home can help you guide a teacher towards adjusting practices best suited to meet the, the child's needs. Um, consistency. So creating routines and providing consistent opportunities to enhance the child's learning, um, both at home and at school. This reinforces the notion that the family and teacher are working together to support the, um, the child. Um, and collaboration, plan and problem solve together with families to develop specific positive strategies to help children have a positive experience at the child care center. Um, so let's break up those three C's down a little bit more. So communication, making sure that we communicate with the children's family early on, early on and throughout their um, in, entire time at the child care center. We want to start by letting know, letting the families know what that you would like to like for them to play a part in creating the best care for their um, their a child. Um, discuss the best ways to communicate with them. Um, this might be um, notes at at pickup time. Maybe they would prefer you to call them and speak to them. Email and um, text message are always an option. Um, and it is important to ensure that co um, consistent um, <laughs> communication. Um, the best kind of communication is open, clear, constructive, and timely. Frequent two-way communication is important to keep families informed on what's happening at the child care center and for teachers to be informed on um, all the things that their um, their child is um, is doing. And allow time for meeting with with families to discuss their children's behaviors and strengths and invite families to share their own strengths and child strengths and challenges, likes and dislikes um, and allowing time for the parent to um, goal set with you is going to be important. Um, consistency. Um, ask about what what routines are like for the child at um, at home and share ways families could work with children at home to encourage their education and um, 
de development. This could be things such as creating routines, providing learning uh, materials, um, reading to the child, encouraging healthy habits and um, physical act activity. Um, talk to talk about talk about the methods for ensuring teachers and families are on the same page when it comes to plans and expectations. This type of partnership can send consistent messages to the children and lets them know that their family and teacher are are working together as a um, a team. And collaboration. Speak with families about their child's needs. If a family has any concerns, offer modifications that align with the child's strengths and challenges. Plan and problem solve issues that may arise. If the relationship and communication channels are developed early, it will be much easier to address challenges if and when they appear. Collaboration and planning with families involves acknowledging the need to work together to address concern, staying focused on finding a solution and not placing blame, making plans that involve support and re responsibility at both home and, and the child care center. Follow through on plans and checking back to make sure progress is being made. Thank you for watching. More info to come on our continued series about exposure prevention next month will be alive on Zoom. So please look forward in your email for a notice about that. If you have any questions about what you've seen in this video, feel free to reach out to your coach and they will get back to you with whatever response you're looking for. Hope you have a great day. Thank you for joining us.